So let's look now at super keys, primary keys, candidate keys. We're going to look at some SQL information because you can't really do anything meaningful in data stage unless you really have your SQL stuff down and especially primary keys and candidate keys and super keys. So let's just briefly review these things. If you take your employee table, each of these are columns, of course. They're also called fields. And if any single column can uniquely identify the row, and that row is called a tuple, then it becomes what's called a candidate key. And among your candidate keys, you can choose one of them, and that is called the primary key. And then like it says here, these are all super keys, uh, like we discussed earlier, uh, the super keys will uniquely identify a row. And of course, it's possible that no single column could uniquely identify the row, and that's when you get into this discussion about compound and composite keys. Now, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as a key, even though it's the commonly used term, and I use it too, everyone uses it, but in database relational modeling and implementation, a unique key, is what, as it's called, is a super key. That is, in the relational model of database organization, a set, mathematical set of attributes of a relation variable for which it holds that in that all relations assigned to that variable, there are no two distinct tuples, rows, that have the same values for the attributes in that set. So in other words, each row is unique. Now, when you talk about keys, there are essentially three kinds. You have a super key, the candidate key, and the primary key, the ones we've just been talking about. And uh, again, a candidate key is really pr probably the most interesting one, right? Because it's the one that can, it's the minimal super key. It's the one that uniquely identifies that row, that tuple. And among those candidate keys, you choose one that becomes the primary key. And the super key, of course, does not need to be minimal as we've been looking at. Now, this comes from a forum post. You ask if you can have more than one primary key field, and you most certainly can. You can have only one primary key sort of more of an abstract concept. But that can consist of as many columns or fields as you need to uniquely identify your rows. So by definition, a key must be irreducible, a minimal super key. And what is a minimal super key? Well, we just looked at that. A minimal super key is a candidate key. And again, from those candidate keys, you can choose one that becomes the primary. So that means that its most basic definition, a key is a unique identifier. So if you say unique key, it's redundant. For the purposes of determining the uniqueness of primary key values, null values are considered distinct from all other values, including other nulls. If an insert or an update statement attempts to modify the table content so that two or more rows feature identical primary keys, it is a constraint violation. According to the SQL standard, primary key should always imply not null. And we'll talk more about nulls later, but and you can read the rest of this if you're interested in that. Now, the we need some basic vocabulary to review of that. They this is this is a good review. Select is what's called a keyword and instructs the query to retrieve the data, of course. This is the list of fields, so it specifies which fields to display. And here we're talking about you can see we have the name of the table, and then the dot is the field or column. It's the same thing. The from is a clause. So we have a select keyword, but a from clause, which defines the data source. And then you have the where clause, which supplies the criteria. And the semicolon marks the end of the statement. You have an order by clause. So this is, you can see the pattern. Everything below the select that is a keyword essentially is a clause, introduces a clause. And the order by clause defines the sort order. Okay, and that of course would go out and grab the first name, the last name from that table and do a join, the where introduces joins. We'll talk about joins in a second. Um, where the office, um, in, in one table, the table staff, there is a field called office and that needs to say London according to the where clause. Now, there are many types of joins, of course. This is a nice review of them. The most common one is an, probably is an inner join, where between the two tables you get the, the data in here in the middle. And I'll let you sort of read through these. But this is, this is very, very useful. In data stage, you can do inner joins. You can do left outer joins. You can do right outer joins. You can do these sort of main four, one, two, three, four uh, joins. And there's a full outer join as well, uh, which is uh, here. We
we get a full outer join, which is pretty useful. And we'll talk more about that in data stage. Those are called um, merge stage, the join stage, and the lookup stage. They they all have uh, let you do varying things, but um, we'll talk about that soon. These are the main types of SQL joins. And then just as a review of what on earth a join is, so assuming you're joining, uh, you know, if you have two tables and you want the information from table one to be combined with the information from table two, you join them together. And in order to join them, you need to have some column that shares the values, and that's uh, that's a join. So assuming you're joining on co columns with no duplicates, which is a very common case, an inner join of A and B gives the result of A intersect B. So good old math terminology here. The inner part of the Venn diagram that we just looked at. An outer join of A and B gives the results of A union B. That is the outer parts of the Venn diagram union. So here's an example. Suppose you have two tables, A and B, single column each, data looks like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, and A, and B, 3, 4, 5, 6. So note that 1 and 2 are unique to A, and 3 or 4 are common in both, they both have 3 or 4, and 5 and 6 are unique to B. So if you do an inner join, you're going to have something that looks like this, an inner join using either of the equivalent queries gives, gives the intersection of the two tables, that is the rows, the two rows, that they have in common, which is 3 and 4. So select star, which is every column, from A, that's table A, inner join B on A dot A equals B dot B, and this is what you get. You get 3 and 4 because that was the inner part. If you do a left outer join, a left outer join will give all rows in A plus any common columns, common rows, sorry, in B. So you have everything in A is basically going to be listed. If it's not in B, you'll see that listed as null. And then whatever's common will also be shown, so 3 and 4. That's a left outer join. Left because left left because A came first, honestly. <laughs> if, if A is listed here, that is the one that is left. And a right outer join, and also because it says left here, really. Uh, right outer join is really the opposite, so it's going to give you everything in B. And then whether or not there's a match on A is based on wh what's common. So 3 was in both tables, you get the 3 listed on both of them. Four was also there, but you know A didn't have five and it didn't have six, and that's why you see nulls. So that is the right outer join, and then you have a full outer join, which, as it says, a full outer join will give you the union of A and B. That is all the rows in A and all the rows in B. If something in A doesn't have a corresponding datum in B, then the B portion is null, and vice versa. So select star from A, full outer join B on A dot A equals B dot B. And then there you go. One, two, three, four, and null, 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 three, four. Again, the threes and the fours uh, were shared, so you see both. And one and two were only in A, and five and six, five and six were only in B. And that is a full outer join. Another thing you have to keep in mind is that, especially in DB2, you have something called merge, and this is a SQL standard, a Nancy standard. And a merge is the upsert. So you've probably heard of this before. So the idea is that if you're trying to put data into the database, and maybe the data is in there, but if it and if it is, you want to update it. But if it's not in the database at all, you need to add it to the database. That is an upsert or an update first, and if it's not there, you insert it. This is the syntax to do that, and you can s you can sort of read it. It's fairly straightforward, but it takes a couple minutes maybe to, if you've never seen it before you merge into your target data your target table so you can merge into this is the table you're going to be working with and you're using some source so this might be like uh, your CSV file or another table in the database this is your source data on some sort of condition and then when that condition is matched then you're going to do your update you're going to just set this is common syntax here this is the traditional typical SQL syntax for doing an update, and then same thing with insert. So if you want to look at it in terms of a diagram, this, uh, this is a nice little uh, flowchart that explains how that works. And then here is a quick diagram uh, showing the same thing. 